All right, great. Thank you very much. Uh, it's good to see everyone. I hope everyone is well. And um, we have a lot to cover today, but um, before we get started, I just would like to uh, to welcome Ana Haita Kotval and Detective David Clark. Uh, they are our newest task force members, and we look forward to uh, their contributions. They're, they're both uh, outstanding, and I think that they have a tremendous amount to lend to the efforts that we're engaged in. Um, Again, the county executive will join us a little bit later, and we also expect that the county deputy county executive will be joining us as well. And um, our next task force meeting um, is originally scheduled for November 19th. Uh, at this point, um, we are going to have to determine whether we'll continue to keep it on the 19th, but we'll discuss that. We will contact everyone and let everyone know uh, a bit later. Um, with that, look forward to uh, hearing the reports from the various uh, working groups and uh, as a part of each of the working groups, uh, Roy Frazier and myself know that there's been a tremendous amount of effort. And I, I just would like to mention that at this point, we have to be approaching 100 meetings overall. And I think that that's fairly extraordinary, not just the number of meetings, but uh, the effort that's put on uh, and that's, that's set forth for each of the meetings. And um, each of the, I believe now, 35 uh, members of the task force have, have all been pivotal and just provided a tremendous amount of information for us to consider as we try to uh, make sure that we're doing everything to make the Westchester County Police Department the best it can possibly be. And I, in my estimation, we're very well on our way. Uh, so with that, I will hand it over to Co-Chair uh, Leroy Frazier. Thank you, Mayo. Uh, I join Mayo in thanking you for all your hard work. Uh, as Mayo said, we have witnessed it firsthand. I am very, uh, I, I just love the participation, the fact that everyone has something to offer and an opinion and is not afraid to share it. And uh, I look forward to the work ahead. And just to, along that line, we are getting uh, ready to roll our sleeves up and uh, certainly uh, nail down certain vital points and uh, do additional research and begin the writing. Uh, it's a tough task. We get a lot of questions from time to time from outside in terms of uh, wondering what the outcome will be. And the only thing that uh, I usually respond is that uh, one thing I can promise you is that uh, this task force is doing uh, putting in the work and uh, we'll get the results out to you uh, toward the end. But I guarantee you that the work is being done. Uh, having said that, uh, again, um, thank you. We, uh, before I call on the uh, first reporter, I think uh, Commission, uh, Legislator Smith uh, would like to say a couple of words. You have to, un uh, there you go. Um, and I, I you. others to, uh, feel free to come out the video. I'll start your video. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, uh, appreciate it, and, and Mayo, uh, you guys have been phenomenal co-chairs. And um, I just wanted to briefly just really express my, um, you know, my thanks for, uh, you know, uh, Board Chairman Ben Boygan and, and Executive George Latimer uh, in appointing me to this task force. Uh, I want to also express uh, how, um, you know, just I've, I've really appreciated being able to uh, be involved and collaborate and, and collaborating with uh, a, such a such a broad, uh, uh, diverse uh, spectrum of you know very um, committed and qualified individuals on this task force, both in uh, you know in the subcommittees as well as uh, you know the task force as a whole. The work we're doing is so important. And, um, you know, I know I've had, uh, I've been having many ongoing conversations with uh, uh, members of uh, uh, my, my community uh, regarding the, the county task force, um, the efforts that are, that are being, uh, that are underway uh, locally across the county uh, and, and the uh, separate jurisdictions. And I just, you know, I, I think that we, we, are, we are moving in the right direction, that there's, there's, there's some really positive energy behind this. And that we're going to see some really good positive results come uh, out of this, and, and it's just, and and it's only because we've been able to come together, each one of us, um, and and you know work through these issues, set aside uh, you know the differences, and, and find the common ground for the good of of, of the community, uh, for the good of the county, and um, that that's really I just really wanted to to express that, and and again you know Leroy uh, Leroy and Mayo, you guys have been fantastic. 
uh, co-chair. So thank you for your leadership. Thank you. It's greatly appreciated. Yes, thank you. And so for the first report, uh, I think the report is uh, Tejas and Tala for training and equipment. Thank you, Leroy. I appreciate that. Uh, it's been a pleasure to serve on this um, committee and on this task force. So many of you know that I'm the executive director of the Human Rights Commission, and uh, it's been a very busy time at the commission this year. At the beginning of the health pandemic, we worked with the Asian American community to talk about discrimination and hate. And since George Floyd's murder, the commission has been hosting an education and empowerment series on fighting racism and hate. Uh, if you can believe it, the sixth program in our series is tonight at six o'clock. Dr. Bryant Marks will talk about race and allyship. He's he's a dynamic speaker. He's talked to a lot of police departments across the country on implicit bias and other topics. So if if, if anybody's interested in coming to the program, please shoot me an email or send an email to human rights at westchestergov.com. And I'm happy to add you to the list. Um, thanks for allowing me to go first today um, so I can get ready for the program tonight. All right. Um, I want to make a note that our committee, like I imagine many other committees, is having very spirited discussions. So some of the dis some of the recommendations I'm going to talk about today are not necessarily the result of unanimous uh, findings with, within our committee. Um, and then to piggyback off of what Legislator Smith said and what Mayo and Leroy talked about, as if we need a further reminder of how timely our work is, this past week there was a story about two high school students in Louisville who obtained copies of a PowerPoint presentation used by the Kentucky State Police Department. They reviewed the PowerPoint materials and found that they included quotes and references to Adolf Hitler in the training materials. Specifically, the PowerPoint referenced ruthless violence. Uh, and since the story's broken, the Kentucky State Police Commissioner has announced his resignation. I can share a copy of the newspaper article with the whole group if anybody's interested. So let me talk a little bit about what our committee has been doing. Our most recent meeting focused on the following specific top topics. We talked about responding to bias incidents and hate crimes, cultural diversity, sexual harassment, implicit bias, and the duty to intervene, which is part of um, the ethics training. So just to give everybody some background on, on this committee, uh, on the task force, according to the Academy's written materials, the Academy provides 787.5 hours of instruction time plus 160 hours of field time. So that's a total of 947 hours, 947.5 hours of total time. The Academy's instructor, Lieutenant Alonghi, has attended our most recent meeting. And I really want to commend him. His, his input has been incredibly valuable for our committee and its work. Um, and it's worth pointing out the, the county's Academy provides more training time than what's required under the state standards. If you look at what DCJS requires, they only require 699 hours of total instruction and field training time. And the academy provides 947.5 hours of total instruction and field training time. Um, that being said, that's still less than the thousand hours of training time that the state mandates for massage therapists. So I wanna talk a little bit about the specifics. So specifically, the committee was provided with PowerPoint presentations used by the academy for its presentations on cultural diversity, bias related incidents and ethics. On November 2nd, the committee discussed the Academy's training on these topics. Um, pursuant to DCJS standards, the Academy is required to provide five hours of recruit training on cultural diversity, bias related incidents and sexual harassment. That's all one block. And, and according to written materials provided by the Academy, it provides 5.5 hours on this topic block. It's broken down as follows. 1.5 hours on responding to bias related incidents, two hours on cultural diversity, and two hours on sexual harassment. Speakers from Neighbors Link and Sergeant Scroy from the Peekskill Police Department present at some of these trainings. And pursuant to state standards, the Academy is required to provide two hours of training on procedural justice, which includes implicit bias. According to written materials provided by the Academy, it provides five hours on this topic and approximately 2.5 hours of that is focused on implicit bias. So in total, if you were to take the hours that I just talked about, according to the written materials provided by the Academy, 
It provides approximately eight hours of training on cultural diversity, responding to bias related incidents, sexual harassment and implicit bias. This reflects 1 approximately 1% of total instruction time at the academy. The academy's instructor, Lieutenant Alonghi, has stated that these topics are also woven into role playing and reality based scenarios throughout other instructional programming. But the degree to which they're interwoven was not quantified in the committee's meeting. The committee recognizes and appreciates that the academy's instruction levels are greater than the state's mandates, but recommends that the training times be increased for these topics. I'm going to briefly discuss each of the 5 topics today. The 1st topic is responding to bias incidents and hate crimes. So, the PowerPoint provided to the committee was from DCJS. It's a presentation designed for a statewide approach. And the committee reviewed it and recommended using local examples, having a robust discussion on hate symbols, hate signs, and hate groups, and local trends relevant to the county and future trainings. It recommends using recent statistics to uh, as an educational tool. And the amount of time that is spent on this topic should be expanded. The committee recommends using Lawyers Committee on Civil Rights to conduct trainings on responding to hate incidents to ensure uniformity and best practices. The Lawyers Committee on Civil Rights has provided trainings to other police departments nationally on this topic. And one of the things to think about is hate crimes are notoriously um, underreported. There's a substantial underreporting of hate crimes. Some people say less than 50%. Some people say far less than that and less than 5%. So it's important that police officers are trained in responding to these incidents when they are reported. The committee recommends instructing recruits to be aware of local police departments and reporting obligations under Westchester County Public Safety Law, Section 273.01, subparagraph 3, which requires every local police department located in Westchester County to notify Commissioner Gleason of certain alleged codified bias-related crimes and any offense or unlawful act, which after investigation by law enforcement is or appears to be motivated by all or in part by the race, religion, ethnicity, national origin, sexual orientation, age, gender, or disability of the victim or the institutional target. Lieutenant Alonghi suggested that this specific topic also be included during the in-service supervisory training as supervisors are most likely responsible for this reporting obligation. The committee recommends including training on this topic as part of the in-service training component as well. It did not appear that it was included in recent in-service trainings. The committee recommended listing the Westchester County Human Rights Commission as a resource in the PowerPoint presentation for non-criminal hate-related incidents. So I'm, I'm, I'm giving you guys a lot of specifics and I'm happy to answer any questions. At, at the end, Blanca, did you have something? Okay. So the next topic I want to talk about. No. Okay. The next topic I'm going to talk about is cultural diversity and awareness. This training is primarily conducted by Neighbors Link, a local community organization, and Sergeant Scroy from the Peekskill Police Department, who does a training on LGBTQ um, sensitivity. The specific training time for this topic is only two hours. The training is limited in scope and does not address the myriad of cultures, religions, and ethnicities found in the county's diverse population of 1 million residents. The committee recommends that this training time be increased to incorporate people of all backgrounds and cultures. Lieutenant Alonghi discussed that since the committee's first meeting at the academy's offices and its initial recommendations, the academy is considering expanding training time for cultural diversity and awareness to two full, to two full days based on an NYPD training model. The committee and Lieutenant Alonghi discussed details of this approach and they're still being uh, worked out. Lieutenant Alonghi advised that he didn't believe that this increase in training time would increase the length of the academy's course. And, he, and that he believed that time could be taken from other topics such as fingerprinting techniques. The committee recommends increasing the training time for this topic to two days and using the NYPD model and or working with outside partners to ensure that all cultures, backgrounds, and minority populations are included. The next topic is sexual harassment. This is the third part of that five hour block that I talked about earlier. The committee was now provided with a PowerPoint presentation on the two hour block that the Academy does on this topic, but Lieutenant Alonghi stated that the Academy follows the county's training protocols and the committee is not aware of a need to increase this training block. 
The next topic is procedural justice. And part of procedural justice is the implicit bias component. Lieutenant Alonghi typically teaches a two and a half hour block on implicit bias during the academy to the recruits. He has completed the state's train the trainer program on this topic. And while the commission appreciates and recognizes the academy's training times are again greater than the state's mandates, it recommends increasing the training time for implicit bias. Lieutenant Alonghi stated that since the committee's first meeting at the academy's offices, and at our initial recommendations, the Academy is considering increasing the procedural justice component to cover two days. This expansion would increase the amount of time for implicit bias training as well. And the final topic I want to talk about is ethics and bystander intervention training. Lieutenant Alonghi discussed that there is a one hour component to duty to intervene training during the ethics piece uh, at the Academy for new recruits. And he said that the Academy uses a New Orleans police department model called EPIC. And EPIC stands for ethical policing is courageous. Um, the committee had discussed using uh, the Georgetown ABLE model, which stands for active bystander for law enforcement training. Uh, Lieutenant Alonghi suggested the committee continue looking at the Georgetown model and seeing if that could be used as a supplement for what the Academy does right now. The Georgetown model is slightly different. It's not intended for recruits directly. It's more of a train the trainer, train the trainer model. Um, so we're still looking to that as a as a potential supplement uh, that could be used at the academy as well. So those are the five topics we looked at in our most recent meeting. And you know our work is still ongoing, and we'll continue to make additional recommendations. So I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody might have on these topics. Right now, there aren't any questions in the chat. However, if you do have any questions, please submit them there or let me know you would like to ask a question. Thank you. Tejas, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, very thorough, tremendous amount for us to digest, but I know you put a tremendous amount of effort into this report. So thank you very much and thank you to the working group. Thanks, ma'am. Yes, thanks, Tejas. And I would just remind you for the task force to think of or have follow-up questions or want some clarification, uh, we'll, we will have a, a copy of the report in the shared drive and uh, you can look at it and you can uh, speak to uh, someone in the group and share uh, additional information that you feel uh, could be helpful. I uh, actually neglected to uh, beg your pardon when I, in my, when I initially spoke to let you know that uh, I have to leave a little early today, maybe about 15 minutes uh, prior to uh, ending, uh, because again, this type of work is uh, expanded and we get in requests from uh, throughout the uh, county to speak. So I'm gonna be speaking on uh, not so much police reform, but the criminal justice at another form immediately after this one also, that one begins at five. Okay, uh, so we'll move to the uh, next uh, group and uh, we'll, uh, and, I, and I do expect, notwithstanding the completeness of Pages' report, that uh, in fact uh, it's, it hasn't been that long, and I think most groups have had one, maybe two meetings since the last uh, task force meeting. So we we understand that uh, uh, this time there won't be as much meet as when we first came together three meetings ago. This being our fourth one. Um, I think we'll move next to uh, community engagement. And I believe the uh, report is Robin Schlesinger. Am I correct, Blanca? Uh, it's actually Chief Padilla. Oh, Chief Padilla, <laughs> I'm sorry. From Qualification and Recruitment. Okay, we'll go with them. Sorry about that. We'll go with them. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Yes, we can. So, my name is Chief Melvin Padilla from Bedford Police Department. I'm happy to be participating in, in this process, and I'll be reporting for qualification and recruiting working group. Um, so, we've had two meetings since since our last full committee meeting, which was on October 6th. So, our last two meetings were on October 22nd and October 26th. At our October 26th meeting, uh, we had the, the previous, actually first let me let me say that we our, our committee had shrunk a little bit. Um, 
we had lost a, a participating member um, that um, let's see. Yeah, former county legislator Lyndon Williams uh, was appointed to county court judge and so we, we were down a member and so we added Detective Clark and we welcomed him. He jumped uh, he jumped right in on that October 22nd meeting and he's been, been an asset and certainly gives additional police perspective on some of the topics we were talking about. Uh, on October 26th, State Senator Jamal Bailey, 36th Senatorial District, uh, was our guest. And that was a that was a pretty lengthy and fruitful discussion, uh, mostly related to how we could, from a state legislative perspective, change the civil service rules so that it would allow more flexibility when we're when we are considering candidates to come into this profession. Um, I think there's a general consensus amongst uh, this subcommittee that the foundation for which we build upon uh, all of these other ideas that we're talking about and considering uh, is most important from selecting the right candidate from the beginning because it stems into all of the other things that we're discussing as far as community outreach the messenger matters and so if we can be if we can be more selective if we if we have a lot more flexibility with bringing the best and brightest into this profession then we can utilize those spokespeople to further um, kind of shine light on, on a noble profession and hopefully attract uh, more and better qualified uh, candidates, more so than just a lucky Saturday, as some would, some would characterize it as achieving, uh, you know, a very good score on a civil service test does not in and of itself create uh, a situation that it's going to be an effective and professional police officer. Um, so some of the other things that were discussed during during that meeting with uh, with the senator were the idea of um, consistency in reporting and kind of buy-in from municipal police agencies for reporting on race when it comes to traffic-related uh, interaction, traffic enforcement, and that kind of thing. And one of the things that that had come up was uh, the large majority of police agencies. Are reporting their traffic data, traffic enforcement data to the state via a program called Tracks, and within that program, uh, it's an electronic ticketing system in which you know there's a printer in in the police car, and you have a car stop, and and the officer has decided to issue a summons for some for some violation. Uh, it's all electronic. It's put into a computer. It gets printed out on paper. That's what's issued to the motorist. But the reporting of that activity. From the municipality to the state is via most often via this system called tracks. Within there, there's a section where you can put the race, which I might add is the best guess of the officer on the scene, since we can't ask the motorist what their race is. The best guess based on visual, you know, what, what they see can be put in a box that's in this system. Now that's in, in ours, for instance, in Bedford, that box was grayed out, so we weren't even able to put information into that box. If we were able to get consistency and make that a mandatory box, then in a de facto way, since most agencies are reporting util utilizing this system, we would get large buy-in and we would get the data that many are looking for to track the, uh, the activity as it relates to race uh, when it comes to traffic enforcement. But those were two of the things from kind of the state side of, of, of the process uh, that would help in, in some of the challenges we're looking at and some of the uh, frustrations we're finding in, in looking for data related to that kind of statistic. Um, other key issues, uh, overall qualifications and recruitment were, as I, as I opened with, it's primarily dictated by the civil service rules as it relates to test scores and reachability. Um, right now, when I have the opportunity to speak in whatever public forum, I, I try and, and educate those listening as to the process for civil service and how it's very restrictive, especially when we're talking about the lack of diversity in policing, specifically with Westchester County in general, Westchester County agency, there's 43 different police departments within Westchester County. And of those 43, there's probably 36 or 37 uh, agencies that pick off of one civil service exam. And with the civil service rules in New York State that limit it only to three or more in any one score, 
creates a situation in which, because the test lasts for four years. And so all of these different agencies are picking off of this one list. So if you have more than three candidates in any one score, you can't talk to the next score down. So right now we are in the fourth year of the current civil service exam. And um, I know our purpose here is to specifically talk about the Westchester County Police, but they experience the same thing that all other agencies within the county experience with regard to the restrictions associated with this list. And so right now we're four years in and it got extended because of COVID. So there'll be a fifth year added to this one list. There are only a handful of higher scores left. So we have 36 different agencies right now that can only select from like 11 candidates. I have 350 additional candidates for the next score down that I can't even speak to. I can only speak to these 11 candidates that have the one score. Right now we're in the 90s. And so that becomes extremely restrictive, especially from a diversity perspective, because we can't talk to any additional candidates. So we can't impose this viewpoint that we don't have enough diversity if we don't first look at the rules in which we have to operate under in order to select to select different candidates. In addition to that, there are three different civil service lists in which to participate. One is the local list, one is the general list, and one is the Spanish speaking list. But you can't use the, the local list and the general list simultaneously. You have to pick one or the other. And once you pick one, you're stuck with that choice for the entire life of the exam. So that becomes extremely restrictive when we're talking about wanting to select officers that are part or have been part of the community in which they're serving. Because in municipalities such as the town of Bedford, there's 18,000 residents. The local list may only have 15 or so candidates. And on that list, there might not be a very good match from using any metric, not necessarily just looking from, uh, from, a, from a diversity standpoint. And so if I were to select that list, I'd be locked into that for the next four years. And I have eight officers that are retiring this, this year, by the end of this year alone. And just think about how restrictive it would be to only pick from a list of 15 and have to pick eight people off of that list and then have to speak to the standards in which we upheld to select those to become part of our community, part of our policing community. And uh, it becomes very frustrating. Um, some of the other things is changing the narrative regarding black and brown communities and the negative impact and stigma that they believe regarding becoming a police officer. But I think when, when we speak to that challenge in, in itself, success is credibility. If we create a situation in which there are more models, more minority models of success within this profession, and we give the true and genuine belief that minorities have a chance to excel and move up the ranks within this profession, then that will in and of itself create a bit more uh, attractive package for, for more minorities to get involved. I can say as it relates to myself as being one of the few uh, minority chiefs within the, within the county, and, and to my knowledge, the only Hispanic chief at time, um, it has assisted with recruiting, not recruiting, but attracting more uh, potential applicants um, to sit before me to, to apply for the job. And, um, and we've been able to be, you know, for, for an agency of our size, we've been able to be uh, pretty diverse. We also talked about the need for more robust implicit bias training, recruitment of officers, as I've just touched upon, lack of diversity, which I touched upon, um, which largely is uh, in large part, not solely, but in large part is due to the, to the restrictions, civil service restrictions imposed, community policing, uh, adding uh, things such as Citizens Youth Police Academy, and um, perhaps interagency cooperation with some of their training programs. Detective Clark uh, had shared that the Mount Vernon Police Department uh, implicit bias training is, is, is pretty robust and, and thorough, and he offered that to be available for any other agencies to be able to take a look at as a template and, and uh, kind of create their own in-house. Um, also practice test and tutoring to prepare for the test. And um, that is available. There's a, there's a company called PTS, which is the most common one that, that, that I'm aware of, police uh, uh, tutorial services, which 
uh, assist with becoming proficient in some of the skills necessary to do well on the entrance exam, um, which a lot of, it, it's a lot of skills that you can, that, that are practiced, uh, meaning with reading comprehension and different things like that. There's not necessarily anything specific to study for. It's more so a skills related test as it relates to reading comprehension, memory retention or memory recall and different, different things such as that. Um, so some initial recommendations we're creating uh, the possibility of school curriculum for people in underrepresented communities uh, to create a program or a lesson plan in schools like the Youth Police Academy to get credit for it, like, like um, for instance, in a, in a BOCES type program. Um, but once again, this would require some tweaks in the civil service rules. So just, just weight these recommendations with that as an asterisk next to your, next to your mind. Uh, a proposed CCRB for the county, which would oversee all municipalities. Now, we weren't necessarily looking specifically, specifically at that. That's probably more relevant for um, the accountability um, subcommittee, but uh, it did come up as a topic of discussion within, within, our, committee, within our subcommittee. Um, something that did come up in, as a point of discussion was the perceived lack of uh, diversity with regard to supervisory positions within the uh, Westchester County Police Department. I can't speak directly to that. This was a topic that had come up um, and it was something that uh, the committee was looking for more information on what the breakdown of the, what the racial makeup of the Westchester County Police is and then how many um, are spread amongst different assignments, different um, specialized assignments, whether it be emergency services, whether it be supervisory, whether it be investigative or, or detective assignments, um, that information was asked. Um, another thing that had come up was licensing, professional licensing for police officers, and also uh, creating a requirement for continuing law enforcement education, uh, similar to how some in the in the medical profession are required to have a certain amount of credits uh, in any given year to be able to maintain their licensure. Um, something that I saw that that had come up, I was unable to attend the last full committee meeting. Um, but something, a question that had come up was, should we should we explore requiring a minimum amount of formal education, such as two years in college or some type of college degree? And I wasn't able to comment at that at that time, but I, I would highly uh, discourage the idea of imposing such a restriction um, that would be counterintuitive to what I was speaking of before about wanting or needing more uh, flexibility with with who we are uh, interviewing and who we're who we're bringing into this profession. If we add another restriction on top of the restrictions that already exist, I think in turn we're going to reduce the amount of people that we have access to interview and not uh, expand it. And, and I think right now what we need, what I'm saying we absolutely need is the ability to expand the pool of potential candidates so that we can uh, create much more professional, much more uh, diverse, uh, much more deserving um, of wearing the uniform. Uh, findings on racial breakdown of every police department. We, we had talked about that, but something uh, that may not be common knowledge is every agency's report is required to report to the state DCJS Department of Criminal Justice Services on an annual basis. Uh, it's called the New York State Uniform Crime Report. And within that, there is a report called the Personnel Characteristics, which is broken down by race and ethnicity, uh, both sworn and civilian. And all agencies are required on an annual basis to report to DCJS with that breakdown. So that could be a resource for information that I know many within this committee and beyond have been looking for as far as the racial breakdown of municipal agencies throughout the state that can be a place to get more information. Um, something else that came out was, came out was the discussion of, of the STAT Act, which was recently passed, Bill that was passed in, to my understanding in June of 2019, in which, um, I'm saying full disclosure here, I'm not an expert on this STAT Act, but the information I was able to get was New York could be requiring to collect and report a broad range of data on policing, including 
total number of people who died during an interaction with police or in police custody, the race, ethnicity, age, and sex of anyone who dies during an interaction with the police or in police custody, the location of law enforcement activity and related deaths. And I think I'm missing a page here, but bear with me while I pull up this website. Um, the data would be collected and published monthly on public websites of the Division of Criminal Justice Services, which I mentioned earlier, DCJS. And uh, the Police Stat Act also includes safeguards to ensure personal identifying information, such as individuals' name, date of birth, or social security is not released. So I got that information on NewYorkSenate.gov. Um, if you Google Senate passes Hoylman's Police Stat Act, you can get more information on that. But I believe some of what's in that is relevant to the discussion at hand. Um, other than that, I just think once again, it's important to kind of reiterate that a lot of the ideas and topics and, and ways in which uh, we, we are looking at reform, uh, it's important to build upon a proper foundation. And to the extent that we can really expand our ability to speak and attract, speak to and attract the best and brightest and the up and comers uh, that are interested in this profession, then I think we'll be able to bring better officers in, better recruit officers in, better new officers in to kind of instill the new age of policing into them from day one. And then I think that future problems can be avoided, um, such as we're experiencing nationwide. With that being said, I'm open to any questions or comments that anyone might have for me as it relates to this committee. Okay, thank you very okay. much Steve, for the, for the uh, comprehensive report. Really appreciate it. Uh, there have been a couple of questions uh, in the chat. I'll put them out. Uh, I, I think Chief Padilla, uh, they're related to track, uh, the track system that you were speaking of, and perhaps you would know, uh, you can get opine or certainly uh, let us know whether or not there's a yes or no to any of them. Uh, there were a couple of questions that really centered <laughs> centered around whether or not whether or not how we can gauge the accuracy of the report. Are, are you guys hearing the feedback I am? Yes. I have no idea what that's coming no from. Mayo, <laughs> you asked the questions. Maybe we'll be there. <laughs> All right. Hold on one moment. Hold on one moment. I'm getting the same thing. I'm getting okay. If, if you're not speaking, if you could mute yourselves, please. Yeah. Yeah. Those who are not speaking at this point, please. Speak. Okay. Now that okay. that is. Now that that is. No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> uh, can, you uh, can you see the chat box? Can you see the chat box? Go ahead, Leroy. Oh, Chief Padilla, are you able to see the chat yourself? I can see the chat box, yes. Yeah. Okay, well, as okay, you can see, there are a couple of questions. Regarding how you engage the accuracy. You know what I'm going to suggest, you know Leroy? I'm going to suggest that we just open it up. If anyone has particular questions, let them ask the question. It'll probably be easier to try to scroll through the list of the uh, that exists in the chat. I see that uh, um, Legislator Smith had a comment, I believe. If that's correct, uh, Colin, please uh, ask your question of the chief. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayo, and thank you, Chief Padilla, for the uh, uh, very informative presentation. Um, the question's been batted around a bit since you've been talking, or since I asked it, really. But my initial question was just because you had said that, um, you know, the reporting on race has to do uh, is, you know, is largely a matter of, you know, an individual officer's sort of best guess. And um, I mean, I, I, you know, like in everyday life, that's I think that's how we all sort of, you know, do it when when we're interacting with folks. But from a you know from a more analytical perspective in terms of you know getting this data uh, for the purpose of analyzing it and, and and crafting policy around it 
I guess, I guess, you know, uh, the, the more accuracy, the greater accuracy, obviously, uh, the more informed we will be and, and hopefully more effective. So um, are there um, and, and there's been some suggestions in the, in the chat box. So I guess my, my, my question was, uh, is there any uh, I, any suggestions regarding how to um, how to, you know, maybe gauge when you when your officers are interacting with uh, somebody at a traffic stop and they're trying to determine uh, the race of that individual uh, gauge that that goes beyond just uh, the observation uh, of that individual. Um, well, specifically related to the context of what I was describing with tracks, um, there there wouldn't be any more specific way because we we can't ask that question, or, and we certainly wouldn't want to go down that road to be regularly or or on any basis really asking for the, the race of the motorist it's not relevant to the, the violation that occurred but relevant to this discussion in trying to discover or identify uh potential issues with courses of conduct with either agencies or officers associated with this enforcement uh, activity it is a way in the short term for us to be able to get a larger swath of information that doesn't currently exist there's only really pockets of information that currently exist and since we already have a mechanism in place to be electronically reporting enforcement activity to the state that already has a box there that is sometimes um, populatable and is some, sometimes isn't, if we can, if we can, in the short term, once again, mandate the use of that box, it can give us uh, a quicker access to a larger, um, like I said, swath of information. It, I'm not suggesting that this would be the end. Of, of trying to get deeper and more more specific information about the pra enforcement practices of agencies, uh, local and, and throughout the state. But if we're looking about getting large buy-in and, and, and quicker access, that is one way I would suggest we can do it and then continue the discussion as to how we might be even more um, thorough in, in, in getting the deeper, more granular uh, information that, that you're asking for. For instance, tracks isn't going to to give information on a release with warning. And so it's only going to give you information on summonses that were issued and, and something that is relevant uh, to be able to compare is all right. Well, who's getting warnings and who's getting summonses? And so that is the one step further that I'm talking about that more discussion has to happen as far as how we can do that and how we might be able to get um, a kind of a clearinghouse of information so that a comparison can be made amongst, you know, the entire region and not just, you know, neighboring agencies or, or singular agencies. Uh, hopefully that answers your question because it, it's kind of complex. No, thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. much. There was one follow-up question, uh, which is whether or not tracks result, uh, uh, records information if a search is done uh, uh, after the stop and whether that's broken down by race or contraband recovered and that sort of thing. You're, you're muted, Chief. Muted, Chief. Go, okay. Go, okay. <laughs> no, it, it won't. Uh, it's not the purpose for the, for the platform. The purpose for the platform is, is reporting um, uh, violation data to the state. Of course, there's a monetary component. That's why the state wants that information because obviously, you know, they they are interested in their portion of the fines associated with those violations. Um, but once again, I'll just reiterate, I'm just suggesting a way to use a current system that's already used widely um, that we might be able to get more information than we currently have. Thank you, Chief. The, Thank the, you, Chief. I will mention that the person also spoke to whether or not uh, uh, to put race on a license, but I think that's a larger issue that will go in, uh, uh, into uh, that will require additional research because I'm sure that might have been thought of at the time it was uh, uh, and has been discussed before, and that's something. Uh, we can look at a little bit uh, further uh, within committee. And I, I would just suggest that one of the things we might want to contemplate is having a voluntary uh, option for someone to identify. 
uh, as you see quite often when people are on applications, would you like to be, would you like to discuss your race, your gender, or would you like to opt out? And that way there's, there's no uh, forcing someone to participate in a way that may make them uncomfortable. And the final thing I, I would point out, that's in the, that's also in the chat. We found a lot when we're looking at things so in terms of what the county already does. And, uh, Commissioner Gleason, so county PD already captures the reports, age, sex, race, all traffic stops. And that's been doing that for the last 20 years. Our next report uh, would be Deputy Commissioner Rayner from Policies and Procedures. All right, good afternoon, co-chairs. Good afternoon uh, to my fellow policies and procedures working group. <laughs> um, since the last full time, uh, full task force meeting, uh, the working group for policies and procedures met once. That was on the 2nd of November. No uh, guest speakers since uh, last reporting. With respect to our key ongoing actions, uh, we continue to discuss as a group how policies and procedures are generally created and overseen uh, in the police department. We are currently reaching out to CALIA, which is the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies, in order to learn more about national accreditation specifically how their standards are determined and what work has uh, CALIA done to propagate this accreditation. Additionally, what is the process for accrediting a training facility such as the uh, Westchester County Department of Public Safety's Police Academy? And what could be done at the county level to encourage all municipalities in Westchester to achieve this accreditation? My group plans to meet with Mr. Jeffrey Deskovic uh, in order to discuss his experience as a person wrongly conv convicted, having served numerous years for a, a crime he did not commit. And as a group, we'd like to uh, have a discussion with him to see how some of his experiences may relate to uh, the county police's policies and procedures and what changes uh, may come out of that. Uh, the group is also working to assess whether supervisors, to include those field training officers, um, how, are they sufficiently held accountable uh, for the actions of those whom they supervise? And so that's some of the things uh, that we're, we're uh, working towards uh, getting some answers to, and hopefully prior to the next full task force meeting, will have some of those answers. Uh, with respect to some of our recommendations, in February of this year, the district attorney's office released names of police officers deemed to have uh, credibility issues as a result of their testimony in court cases or uh, based on some other action. With respect to a, a recommendation, uh, the group believes that once a notification is made to the uh, police department, an internal affairs investigation should commence immediately with findings uh, at the end to conclude whether or not the officer's name should uh, in fact appear uh, on that list. And if so, uh, does the officer now lack the ability to carry out uh, his or her duties as a police officer. Next, uh, we would like to explore the possibility of requiring police officers to maintain liability insurance in order to indemnify the county when and if uh, an officer's actions prove reckless or contrary to his or her training resulting in a uh, court-ordered payout. 
this recommendation will probably be best suited uh, at the state level. Next, a thorough review of the department's duty to intervene policy. We would like to consider expansion of the policy beyond use of force. We would like to see um, an addition of a, a whistleblower protection with specific punishment uh, for retaliation. It's been recommended that any retaliation towards a whistleblower should be viewed as a criminal act in nature and referred to the office of the district attorney. Next, we were looking at uh, some of the training at the police academy and we had a discussion on whether or not we could include a block of training entitled uh, de-escalation techniques. This course should mirror the instruction given by the county corrections uh, department and take place under their guidance uh, at the Department of Corrections. We also looked at a policy which would mandate full-time police academy instructors to periodically work patrol duties in order to maintain a, a, a personal knowledge and oversight uh, of the application of the training that's given at the academy. Instructors can then gauge what training is working and perhaps what training needs to be modified or uh, perhaps some sort of reinforcement of the training needs to be done uh, while they're working uh, side by side with some of our patrol officers. Uh, we also spoke about expanding the current policy regarding criminal investigations to address the issue uh, that uh, we've been hearing a little bit about, uh, that being citizens being handcuffed based solely on the officer's assertion that he's doing it for officer safety while he speaks to an individual. Um, we think we may have to look further at that to see if there is some sort of uh, way we can address that in the policies and procedures. Also, we uh, were talking about the establishment of a countywide civilian complaint review board or some other type of civilian board which would investigate allegations of police misconduct. Now, with respect to some of the opportunities that we see, uh, the County Police Department of Public Safety can present itself as a model for other municipal police departments and offer technical assistance to those departments. Implementing national accreditation can save money on liability insurance. Officers trained through nationally accredited agencies are also given significant career prospects. Accreditation can also strengthen grant applications, which can ultimately increase funding for the police department. Implementing policy changes at the police academy can positively impact the policing services of other municipalities uh, throughout the county. Some of the challenges we observed Number one is always costs, the costs associated with national accreditation. Officers in Westchester are oftentimes familiar and friendly with one another as they frequently pass through departments, collaborate across municipal lines, and train at the academy together. This makes detecting incidents of misconduct more difficult and may impede any challenge to the current uh, police officer culture that we experience here in Westchester. With respect to things currently working, uh, the Department of Public Safety has a diverse array of programs and training, which if properly supported and implemented, could create a model policing agency for others to follow. And of course, the public safety uh, 
community policing model that we currently have in Mount Kisco has tremendous potential. And that pretty much concludes uh, our discussions uh, since the last uh, meeting as a full task force. If there are any questions of me, I'll be happy to uh, answer them. Uh, Deputy Commissioner, I, I have a question. Um, I was listening to you and you were talking about the de-escalation training uh, with the uh, police officers in the academy and that it would be taught at Westchester County Department of Corrections. Um, let me just say that I think that's an excellent idea um, because it, it forces the officers to rely on what we've heard commonly known as verbal judo. Um, so I guess what I'm wondering is, is, is that something that we would have to wait to do in terms of a recommendation or is that something that could be implemented right away? Um, do you guys have the power to just automatically say, we're going to institute this in the police academy right now? Well, I would assume, I'm sorry, somebody else was going to answer? No? Um, since there are so many municipalities in Westchester, as you know, I'm sure there'll be some pushback. And so in order to implement uh, something like that in the police academy, I think we'd have to sit down, fully discuss the logistics and get any feedback we're going to get from, of course, the unions and from uh, uh, corrections itself. We'd have to certainly sit down with the commissioner and deputy to find out what they're a feeling is on it and then move the project forward. So I think that's something that we as a as a county, if uh, we have enough buy-in, I think that's something that we could achieve. Thank you, thank you. Sure. Man. Thank you. It, it appears that there's also a question uh, from legislator, uh, legislator Damon Marr, and he was asking more or less, uh, well, well, legislator Marr, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yes, I better, because I, I skipped that typing class in high school. <laughs> so we're going to try to limit, we're trying to limit it just to a few minutes, if you don't mind, but please. Hey, just a question, a quick question, you know, we're talking about CCRB and we also talked about internal affairs, handling certain things like this list of non-credible officers. Could they work in conjunction on on this particular issue, uh, you know, those two uh, agencies or other issues? That's meant to be a question. If, if it has been discussed, whether that that might be a good idea. I'm sorry. Was the question could internal affairs work alongside the CCRB? Or yeah, or should we encourage that or require that? Well, for, for, well for we're looking at a couple of different models uh, as of, uh, recently as yesterday. Um, I was having a conversation about the Albany Police Department and, and their internal affairs. And so we are looking at different models, but certainly one of the models uh, would be and, and probably should be um, the internal affairs uh, department from, for the public safety should be consulting with, of course, any CCRB uh, for things like policies, procedures, um, I would think that would be uh, the liaison for the department to the C, uh, for the CCRB. I just think it's also it's important to note that there's potential uh, that a countywide CCRB would be able to handle complaints from other municipalities. And uh, part of the reason that they would be doing so is to take it outside of those departments and allow for a neutral independent arbiter when it comes to these investigations. Uh, but again, all of these things are things that we would consider and any suggestions that you may have, certainly we'd be happy to consider those suggestions. Sure. I don't think I see any additional questions. Does anybody else have a question for uh, Deputy Commissioner Rayner? All right, it appearing that there are no additional questions at this time. Um, I really uh, um, uh, would love to thank you very much for the effort and for willingness to give the report today, a, a very thorough report. Uh, great, 
great work from the working group and there's overlap uh, and and I'm sure Mr. Chamberlain's going to get into some of the overlap from the accountability group and from other groups when we start to look at at um, this topic it's a topic that really went into a number of different disciplines but but uh, Terry thank you very much uh, outstanding uh, presentation truly appreciate it uh, co-chairs before we continue with our next speaker our county executive would like to say a few remarks thank you you're welcome Thank you very much uh, for the interruption. I'll be brief, but uh, we've had some discussions about the conversations that you all are having and without letting too much of a cat out of the bag, because we're going to be releasing our county budget next Tuesday, and then the legislature will have full uh, opportunity to review it. One of the priorities that we put in the budget is a recommendation uh, that uh, we understand is coming out of your group that is to add a uh, mental health crisis team. And so I think you can take uh, good credit for that. I know the legislature will want to discuss it, but since there are legislators on your committee and everybody seems to have favorably commented about it, uh, and since we do have to put our financial priorities together today, uh, we wanted to let you know that that's just one example. There'll be others, uh, but um, you know we're listening to the dialogue and we're trying to respond. And we do we do agree that there are times when it has to be mental health professionals that are making the response. Uh, you know, we're asking police officers to go into situations and we should have other people trained to be able to do that. So I just wanted to share that with you briefly as you continue your report. We're all trying to respond uh, when the report comes and the board reviews it and we review it. We'll, we'll uh, accept it with uh, gratefulness, but we ain't waiting. If you got a good idea, we're going to try to put it into effect right away. So thank you for that one. I'm sure there are more coming and uh, we'll dialogue a little more as we go forward. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I think there was one other question. It appears uh, that I think Mike Hagan may have had a question. And Mike, did you have a question for for Deputy Commissioner? Uh, on uh, there was one question I had about uh, when talking about uh, um, uh, civil liability. Uh, when it comes to uh, when, it, when it comes to liability, uh, do we have to be uh, you know like if if someone acts outside of the scope or outside of uh, uh, the laws, do they have to be indemnified by the county? I think that as as I understand it from all of the conversations we've had from the different working groups, um, the, the suggestion was not that uh, that the county not be responsible, but it was that under certain circumstances where either the officers were found to have engaged in intentional conduct or reckless conduct, that they would be required to indemnify the county. So the county would be initially responsible, and then the county could come back to the officers and say that uh, they were they were responsible after that. And the suggestion was that it would be limited to reckless or intentional acts, not to a negligent act if somebody has, let's say, a car accident and they're not acting in a reckless or criminal way. Does that answer your question? Uh, I guess. I'm, I, just, I, I just don't think the county is on the hook for intentional acts as it is. So. Well, the county, the county as it stands right now is, and the county would actually, uh, so for instance, if there was a, a use of force, excessive force, and a court found, a jury found that that the uh, officers were liable, ultimately, uh, the county generally covers it. There, there's not responding at superior, which is a legal term. I don't want to get into that right now, but the county generally pays, and, and after that, um, the proposal here would be that the, uh, the officers would then be responsible. And that's something that's being considered right now, certainly not an immediate deliverable. Okay. Thank you. Are, are there any additional questions uh, for Deputy Commissioner Rayner? Okay. So with that being said, um, uh, Deputy Commissioner, I hope you're ready for your questions because this is your opportunity to get back at Kenneth Chamberlain. It's his turn to present on behalf of uh, the accountability working group. So okay. I introduce uh, Kenneth Chamberlain Jr. <laughs> I, I don't I don't know what this hit back thing is all about, but uh, <laughs> you know, um good afternoon everyone. Um my name is Kenneth Chamberlain Jr. I am with the accountability uh working group. I am also one of the founders of the Westchester Coalition for Police Reform that was founded in 2012 after the killing of uh my father, Kenneth Chamberlain Sr. So for me to be a part of the accountability working group 
it's it's very very near and dear to my heart and um i think we have a very great group working together we agree to disagree but at the end of the day we come together and we find that gray area on the subject matter that we we are uh, discussing um our last two meetings uh were october 13th and october 26th and uh as a group, we met with county legislator Chris Johnson um, to look at possible laws that could be drafted um, in terms of uh, holding officers accountable. And we also met with the immediate past president of the National Association of Civilian Oversight and Law Enforcement, uh, Mr. Brian Corr. We thought it was very important to have a conversation with him to get his perspective on civilian oversight. So what we are seeing is uh, this nexus between accountability and transparency, and we acknowledge the public's interest in an independent and open process when it comes to police misconduct, brutality, and criminality. And um, what we have seen especially with many of the public hearings and not just the counties, but if we are on other public uh, speaking forums, we found that one of the main things that people are talking about are the CCRBs with subpoena power. But our group believes that a county run review board would serve as the gold standard and which in turn we need to find a way to encourage the municipalities to uh, buy into that. So uh, this multi-jurisdictional uh, review board, we refer to as the Office of Police Accountability. And it would have subpoena power, of course. Um, we would have independent investigators and resources to hire independent investigators that are separate and apart from the police municipalities. Of course, there would be a point of contact inside those departments, but we believe that we have to have the investigator cannot have any ties to the department that they are that they are looking into or the officer or officers that are being investigated. Uh, in addition to that, the department would also have um, department for whistleblowers report misconduct, uh, malfeasance, and nonfeasance by law enforcement and colleagues throughout the county. And of course, along with that, we talk about data um, because what we find is that when, when we start looking into situations like this, there, there has been no real data until as of late, people are starting now to really compile it. And one of the things that we also looked at and I think it's very important is a, an offender's registry as far as police officers are concerned. And that falls into the data department because it would be on the municipalities to make sure that if you have officers that are guilty of some type of misconduct, brutality, and criminality, and you're seeing that this is a consistent pattern or they have been let go from their departments, um, they need to be in this system. So another municipality won't look at this officer and then hire this officer on their department, which we've seen happen in, in other states. And then that officer, worst case scenario, gets involved in something else criminal or worst case, kills somebody. Um, we believe that you know some of these recommendations, in our opinion, um, are definitely in line with not rebuilding trust with the community, but building trust with the community. Because we have to ensure them that these investigations are being handled properly. Now, of course, when we start talking about oversight, one of the things that, and the reason why we, we want the buy-in from the other municipalities is because what we've heard and what we'll always hear is Where's the money coming from to do all of these different things? So if you have one centralized unit 
uh, that's overseeing all the municipalities in terms of oversight, in my opinion, that should be cost effective. And now we also know that as far as uh, some of the challenges we know, and just like uh, the deputy commissioner said, you know, you'll get that kickback. And especially when we're talking about oversight or civilian oversight, and we, you're looking at kickback from police municipalities and maybe even some cities. And um, because my my opinion, and I'm and I'm not just I'm not speaking for the group at this point in time, is that it shouldn't have to take the governor to uh, mandate something in terms of reimagining or reinventing a law enforcement so that you know the rule of law applies. It it shouldn't have to take the governor saying that. These these cities and these municipalities should already be ready to do things like that if Black Lives Matter. And we know that unfortunately, even after the governor has done what he's done and given these mandates and put all of this stuff out there, that we still see people losing their lives. So what we're doing is we're really trying to put together this blueprint. And you know, and and we have to get the buy-in from the other municipalities. But one way that that's going to happen is, is that we have to have policy that is consistent across the board. You can't have Greenberg having one policy when it comes to something, New Rochelle having something different, and Mount Vernon having something different. It all, every policy has to be in line, and that's how you'll get the accountability. And we know that all of this stuff is recommendations and ideas and you know, creating these big think tanks and no one has the right answer to what effective uh, oversight is, but we think this is a step in the right direction. And, is, and also, you know, as far as what is currently working right now, um, Westchester County Police Department is definitely providing us information, you know, that we can look at. And when we ask questions or we ask for something, we definitely get it. And Brian Core from NACOL has presented us with a great PowerPoint that we would be willing to share with any of the other groups if they want to see it. Um, those are the bullet points um, without me being too long winded. And I guess now I will open myself up to any comments or questions <laughs> that anyone may have. At, at this point, I recognize Deputy <laughs> Commissioner Terrence Rayner. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ken, uh, thank you very much for for a great report and the accountability working group has been tremendous. Um, you know, thank you to all of the members Hi, of the yeah. working group outstanding. And I just uh, want to share uh, that Brian Corr uh, was played a tremendous role in in President Obama's uh, 21st century. Uh, uh, report on police on 21st century policing and the other thing that I want to share is again this this has been an area that many uh, of the working groups have addressed and worked with and it would in all likelihood um, possibly involve shared services where we may be able to enter into working arrangements with other municipalities so that's a positive uh, in terms of all of the different municipalities being able to share possible expenses uh, but the other thing that I thought was interesting is that um, when and and Ken, thank you for having Mr. Core come because Mr. Core came to us as a result of Mr. Chamberlain uh, asking him to uh, suggesting that he present to our group. Uh, but one of the things that he mentioned as we started to talk about this um, this countywide model of CCRB or police accountability and the name would would still uh, have to be determined if we were able to successfully achieve this uh, this. Uh, it would be the first uh, in the United States. We'd be the first county in the United States to have a similar body. Right now, it's us in Allegheny County in uh, Pennsylvania that are exploring it to their knowledge. So I just think uh, not that we're racing to be the first, but the fact that uh, it seems that we are um, on on the right move in terms of what we're looking at and certainly willing to consider what's being done elsewhere. So I want to thank everybody from this working group. Ken, uh, absolutely thank you very much for agreeing to give uh, the presentation. I thought it was a phenomenal presentation. And uh, does anybody else have any questions uh, for Mr. Chamberlain? 
Okay. I don't see any additional questions at this time. Uh, thank you again. And um, at this time, we will move on uh, to Robin Schlesinger. And one moment, please. And uh, Robin will be giving the uh, report for our community engagement working group. Thanks, Mayo. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Very good. Uh, I'd like to briefly report out on the activities of the community engagement working group, which met on the 14th and 29th of October. We had guest presentations from uh, Sergeant Dress and Captain James Greer from Public Safety, and they are, were presenting on the role of school resource officers, which I'll talk a little bit more about in just a moment. Um, the key issues and needs that were primary in um, our discussions. First, expanding the principles of PACT, P-A-C-T, which you may recall stood for, stands for police and community together. And applying this to other communities, uh, starting with Cortland. And this was um, identified in a memo prepared by Supervisor Puglise. Um, and I think many of you know that Cortland also has its own uh, task force for this purpose. And uh, the supervisor mentioned a need to improve communications between police and the community. So the principles identified were the following. Uh, to work in partnership with the community to address their particular needs in a direct and open manner. And the, the terminology that we were using was asset-based community organizing. I think that was important terminology. Community policing and community outreach should be structural and included in a manual if it is not already there um, to show that the department is committed to this important component of policing. Uh, also, funding for community engagement programs need to be consistent. So, for instance, PACT program is fully funded by Neighbors Link. So, um, County Executive Latimer, if you're still in the room and you hear this, please, please take note. Um, that's another budget. Uh, opportunity that we have. Um, school resource officers, uh, there isn't enough data at this point from communities that have school resource officers in their districts. Um, so we do, we, we, with this dearth of information, we, we still were able to glean the following. Uh, training provided for school resource officers, we have these following questions. Does it prepare them for the role working with youth? Is it enough? Uh, do they have enough training or can or should they receive additional training, for instance, to become certified counselors to expand their roles? Um, we had specific questions, for instance, regarding the school resource officers and the participation in of youth in social media, because we recognize the importance of social media in the activities of youth today. Um, moving on to another key issue, uh, the public perception of, of the Department of Public Safety's image and balancing their role as the county police department versus their role as the local police in both Mount Kisco and in Cortland. So um, there was a review of municipal websites for Mount Kisco and Cortland, and do they provide enough information on public safety's roles in these communities? And we didn't think so. That, that's one of the issues that was, was, was cited. Uh, and does the public under, at large understand the role of the department? So these are issues that we, we were able to identify as a working group. Uh, do we need to do branding? That's a, a big question out there. And what is the presence in social media? Is it to inform the community to be proactive or simply to announce the department's accomplishments? Um, final key issue, evaluation of police officers and their role in the community they serve. Uh, so we shouldn't be including, we should be including questions on community engagement in evaluation forms for these police officers. Uh, moving on to initial recommendations. Um, first, and I think this is going to contain some overlap with some of the other groups that have presented, uh, provide implicit bias training and intercultural competency for all officers, no matter who, where they serve. And these trainings obviously should be quite frequent. Um, the second recommendation, and I and I I personally favor this, 
strongly is training in these areas should be done in tandem with actual experts. Uh, the training offer should be a team approach between experts in these topics and law enforcement. I'll digress personally as someone who does training on behalf of a community organization, the loft. I believe that if we were to do training in tandem with with the police, because they've got the expertise in law enforcement, we've got the expertise in the LGBTQIA plus community. I think it would be far better than having someone internally do that that type of training. Um, there is also uh, an opportunity for the police, and we would we we would really love for them to attend some of our own internal training, and and we we do that quite frequently to, into the into our community, and we open it up to, for instance, employers in the community, businesses in the community, and the like. It would be wonderful to have law enforcement there as well. The third recommendation is to provide more substantial information on the role that county police plays in both Cortland and Mount Kisco, and this would be on the uh, the. The, the website and in local municipality websites. So we didn't find enough information there. That's that's like something that I think I've already mentioned. Uh, the fourth recommendation would be to obtain data and feedback from community um, and school community on the role of school resource officers in these school districts to identify the strengths that they possess and also identify areas of improvement. And then finally, to review the department, the department's social media purpose. So we already talked about that a little bit and, and specifically in the area of branding. OK. In terms of opportunities uh, that we see within um, within the area of community engagement. We believe there's an opportunity to develop and foster relationships between experts in the areas of intercultural and implicit bias training and public safety. Um, we also believe there's an opportunity to promote shared service opportunities. I think this was just mentioned. Um, it actually has been mentioned several times. Um, so school resource officers, the creation of a, of a uh, civilian or citizen uh, complaint review board, um, community engagement opportunities and technical assistance to other local police departments. So again, we've got a lot of overlap and community engagement seems to, to cover many of these areas. Uh, Third, strengthen and promote importance of community policing, a very important concept that we've, we've heard a lot about, and community outreach by evaluating officers in this area and fostering support for officers who want to carry forward in community engagement programs. Um, we've talked about cloning, cloning these officers. We're not scientists, but we, 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 know, we know good people when we see them, and we love them, and we want more of them. Um, what are some of the challenges that we've observed? Funding, okay. County exec, I hope he's listening. We need to strengthen the training in the areas mentioned in order to attract these outside trainers. So I'm sure that there are 501c3s, there are volunteer organizations who do this as part of their mission. They do need to offset some costs. So there is some definitely some funding needed to do this. I'm sure that that, that cost is, is very um, um, affordable. Um, we need to sustain community engagement programs in partnership with local municipalities and or nonprofit organizations. We need to allocate additional time and training schedules to provide constant training to every officer annually. And we need to obtain buy-in from municipalities to join in these mutual efforts. I'm coming, coming to a close. Uh, what is currently working? Uh, public safety has experienced fostering relationships with local communities and school districts. And public safety has definitely has a presence in social media. And um, with that, I think there's just one particular material resource that the community engagement working group wanted to mention, which is engagement based policing, the what, uh, how and why of community policing major city chiefs association, which was published uh, in 2015 that we have as a resource. And I will do the best I can to answer any questions that anyone may have. And I would encourage anyone else who's on the working group to to also feel free to chime in. Robin, thank you very much. A tremendous job, outstanding report, and a thank tremendous you, amount of effort. And, and I thank everybody on the working group. And, and as you said, you know, there is a lot of overlap, but the beauty of it is that each working group seems to approach it from a slightly different perspective as well. I think it gives us a complete picture when we look at everything together. Uh, but thank you very much for willing for your willingness to give the report today. Um, My pleasure, and thank thank you, Blanca, for being the glue that holds this whole activity together. Really, absolutely. Thank you very much, Blanca.
Uh, does anybody have any questions for Robin? I see that Dr. Harris Madden uh, did have a, a more of a comment that Mount Vernon had an SRO program. And so there were a number of SRO programs that exist uh, around the county. And, um, you know, they operate differently depending on the community, but we certainly would take all of that into account. If anybody has any information they want to share, we're certainly happy to look at that. Uh, did anybody else have anything that they uh, that they wanted to add or any questions, any observations? Mayo, thank you for reading my comment. I just wanted to add, since Detective Clark is now on the working committee, he would be an excellent resource as he was once an SRO. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Beautiful. Okay, and, and so that, that's outstanding. Uh, if there are no additional questions um, at this time, I believe legislator Terry Clements is available uh, to give the final presentation. And that would be with respect to the transparency working group. Okay, I am here. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Web, WebEx forever, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> all right, so yes, um, we did a lot of work in the transparency. Can everybody hear me? Okay, let me show myself. That would be a lovely thing. All right, there we go. <clears throat> all right, so uh, it, during the um, the meetings that we had, several meetings in the transparency subcommittee group, we talked and worked very hard to figure out how we could um, have policies and procedures, adjudication of civil complaints and misconduct uh, brought to, um, for procedural justice reasons, brought to the public and, and actually making policy and protocols available to public, to the public to provide, uh, you know, transparency when people have issues uh we i think the biggest step that we made recently was to have commissioner thomas gleason who uh provided us with a lot of information about updated uh apps and other policies that they have that they're willing to share and also it was very good that we had a lawrence otis graham attend who is the chairman of the police board to give us some real insight about how that works so we have um, in our working group, we had some uh, initial recommendations from the work that we did. And who I'll start off with, we would like, um, we're talking about the values and principles to the public. Uh, we are going to we engage more with community leaders to ensure the community is aware of the Westchester County's police policies and procedures and activities. We wanted to ensure the community is aware of monthly public safety meetings with respect to the WCPD and those in their municipalities by advertising the dates and times of those meetings on the WCPD website or county executive website or the CE's newsletter. Uh, this will encourage people to uh, tune in and find out what's going on. Having police officers make contacts with civilians to ask if there are any issues or concerns is also good. We're very concerned about <clears throat> and instituting and making sure that uh, every police officer or a vehicle has a body cam or dash cam, which is also very important in terms of transparency. The civilian complaint board uh, is built in on a is built in online system for filing of complaints in favor of as well as complainants against police officers. So it's a two way street. You can definitely contact them for a positive thing because you can also have a positive experience with a police officer or if there is a problem. Also, there's a way to have a FOIL request to ensure such requests are not cost prohibitive for the public. That's been set up. Uh, information initiative ensuring as much non confidential information as possible is available to the public on the WCPD website, including but not limited to the training manual, the policy manual in which use of force policy is stated, dates and time of public safety meetings for the county, as well as links to local municipalities. 
and other non-confidential document reports, which is generally provided via FOIL request. So there are a lot of things that we're putting up and also we're already on the website that were available to the general public. Uh, special needs registry, online, email, or in-person system by which a resident may inform the Westchester County Police Department that they have been such a person residing in their home should a police officer be dispatched. In other words, if there's someone with uh, a mental uh, uh, problems that they have, someone that has other kinds of, of physical limitations or mental limitations so that they're made aware so that they don't come to the house and misinterpret the behavior of that individual. Additional recommendations, the transparency of policy procedure to the public. So, and we also are providing Im implementation ways in which to convey to the public what WCPD does and how they do it. This includes, but is not limited to, limited to ensuring that public knows that the WCPD policies and procedures are allowing the public as stakeholders to participate in the development of the department's policies and procedures. I know that you've already talked about this already, just talking specifically about SROs and schools, which were designed to build relationships between uh, the students and the community. Also, uh, and you may have already said this, uh, the SROs are also a good resource to provide a model for students that may be an, interested in uh, law enforcement careers. Um, well, also when uh, Commissioner Gleason came, he talked about the implementation of the police app. The police app is presently being vetted by uh, information technology. The police app will provide among other things, various information about the department, alerts about activities and most wanted persons. The department should still have information available on the website, but this app could be very useful. All right, so we also have uh, some possible recommendations that we discussed, but not necessarily consensus on everything still working on them. Uh, transparency within systems of adjudication of civilian complaints and misconduct. misconduct. Uh, procedural justice includes, among other things, the public being made aware of police officer complaints and how they are handled and resolved. There has been a robust discussion surrounding whether the department can further the goals of transparency in regards to civili com civilian complaints. The issue seems to center around whether providing reports to the police board regarding civilian complaints furthers the concept of pre procedural justice, i.e. how does reporting to the police board provide the public the opportunity to view the process and its results and the rationale thereof. Um, there's still a perception of lack of accountability. We're not sure we need to continue that discussion. It is important to note that the police board gets involved only if there are charges, specifications and most civilian complaints are settled before reaching that stage. The notion of making annual reports to the police board readily available to the public is a step in the right direction. For example, uh, like on the website, but those reports are only summaries and does not provide specific complaints or resolutions about street or highway encounters between civilians and police officers. In the absence of this public perceptive, perceptive, the public is likely to continue to believe that the police officers are not being held accountable, though they may not be not, may not be the case. Public perception versus reality is often very different. This may also be an area where the county can set up the bar a little higher for the department to follow. Um, so universal records management system throughout the county, having 43 jurisdictions on the same system will help law enforcement to better do their job. There's some co better communications. Assessing the way, access the way in which 9-11 calls are routed. Can 9-11 calls be routed differently when it comes to special needs person? That has to be fleshed out, which is a very important issue. All right, so we're currently working on uh, Westchester County Police Department having a comprehensive website and keep working on that. 
which provides general information to the public, including information pertaining to the history of the department, specialized units, how to become a police officer, making a FOIL request, and filing a civilian complaint, and the Youth Explorer Program. I think our main goal here in the transparency um, committee is really for us to, and we'll remind our comments, um, for, really for us to continue to have this discussion and recommendations so that we have a, a consensus and a goal that recommends a path forward for residents of Westchester and the Westchester County Police that we can work together as respectful partners and solve some of the issues. Thank you. Legislator Clinton, thank you so much. A phenomenal presentation. And again, thank you to everyone from the working group. Uh, just a tremendous amount of effort, lots of meetings and um, and outstanding positive uh, back and forth that allowed us to see a number of different perspectives. So I, I appreciate that tremendously. I know you were struggling a little bit with the technology earlier too. So thank you for, uh, <laughs> we know it was a bit of an issue, but thank you. Uh, does anyone have any questions for the legislator? All right, I can just again, as you can see that we're, we're looking at a number of the uh, similar issues. So there's a lot of, of cross pollination when it comes to a lot of the things that we're looking at, but transparency is pivotal. If we're not transparent, then even when we're doing things well, ultimately it's gonna uh, still not not assist us. So lots of times we're missing opportunities um, to interface with, with the community as well as to show some of the things that we're doing. So thank you, truly appreciate it. Okay. Um, at, at this point, I want to take just a few minutes. First of all, I want to thank all of our liaisons. Uh, you know, they've been phenomenal and they really have, uh, along with Blanca, been, been the glue for what we're trying to do. And it's not easy when you start getting into these chain emails of 25 uh, down, you're trying to figure out where things actually are. So I take my hat off to you. So, um, you know, uh, Copper, uh, Crane, uh, Cheryl and Pulver, uh, Perry, uh, truly appreciate everything. Uh, Jason, outstanding work. Um, Blanca, everybody has just been uh, totally phenomenal, Cheryl and Paul. And um, I want to just talk a little bit about our next steps. And we're really reaching a pivotal point in the effort that we uh, have been engaged in. And we're looking now to uh, to put together our report. And um, hopefully we will have a draft report prepared within the next few weeks. And our, our objective is to have it done uh, before Thanksgiving, and that left us an additional month so that we'd have some time to uh, to be able to review it. If we needed to tweak it, we'd have time to do so, but we wouldn't be rushing to try to get it together, uh, depending on where we are weather-wise in terms of the pandemic, um, host of other things. And thank you, Crystal Collins, as well. Uh, thank you, Crystal. Uh, uh, you, Crystal is also uh, uh, one of our liaisons, and liaisons not only meet with the working groups, but we also meet outside. So I just, uh, I thank all of you and and, and my co-chair Leroy uh, Frazier. So uh, the goal is to have reports that will ultimately uh, sum up the work that we've done. It'll include all of the things that we think are immediately deliverable, as well as some things that we're going to need uh, input from, from the law department on and some things that may not necessarily be things that we can deliver within Westchester County alone, but things that we may need to recommend to the state. Uh, and ideally, our recommendations, our report will be a blueprint for other municipalities, which may be interested in following in our footsteps, um, both in Westchester County throughout New York State and, and certainly throughout the county and maybe beyond. So we hope to have all of this uh, compiled and we'll be meeting and we'll be working a lot over the next couple of weeks to, uh, to have a draft report and then ideally final report that we can submit to the county uh, executive, deputy county executive, and to the uh, board of legislators. And uh, I, I just have to tell you, it's it's been a pleasure working with everyone. We're not finished by any stretch of the imagination, and I'm sure there'll be a number of things that we may continue to do after we're even finished with the report. Uh, but that being said, I think that it's going to be a, a tremendous report. I really look forward to it. And we're not finished again. So if there are things that any of you think we should be considering, by all means, please share that information uh, and if it happens to be something that's outside of your own working group, please share it with us still because we're interested in making sure that we consider um, everything. The goal is to have the best possible recommendations and to implement uh, the best policies. 
So uh, with that, I just truly appreciate it. I couldn't uh, thank you any more than, than uh, you know, I, I can't articulate it as well as I would like, because I think that it's just a tremendous um, amount of sacrifice each of you have made. And um, our next task force meeting will be in December uh, as a plenary session. We don't have a date yet, but we will contact everybody. Uh, and uh, of course, it's a little easier. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have to, for the most part, worry about people's vacation schedules and travel schedules given the pandemic. Um, but we also wish everybody well. We hope that all of you and your family members are safe and are well. So um, that being said, I'll just ask one more time, if there are any additional questions or any observations, any comments, please, uh, you know, we're, we can stay. We're a bit ahead of schedule right now, but if there are any, please uh, let us know. All right, uh, not seeing any, I thank you all. Thank you so much for everything. And I look forward to seeing you all in the near future. And be well, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. So long, Mayo. So thank long, you. Everyone. Be well, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. See you soon. Take care. Hold on. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Oh, I think it saves when the recording. It does? I think so. I mean, if it's maybe, I don't know if you have to set it up that way or what, but I've right. gone to a recording before and the chat was there. Right. Just um, in case I'm going to You did it. say, right. You, yeah. But you, did, yeah, you did say, um, you did say you were recording it. So yeah. I think with the recording, the chat probably stays. But oh, like there's you said. Just in case. Yep. Can you even get in? Yeah.